thank you so much for joining us for the second of three sessions entitled Dinosaurs, Dragons, and Demons, Jewish and Christian Views of Creation. So we have professors uh, Leonard Greenspoon and Anthony Ledon here this evening. Uh, last time I shared um, some very uh, intriguing intros, um, but I will, I will share the highlights. Uh, Leonard, very, very, very bright. Harvard, all these things. <laughs> books, books, stacks of books. Also Jewish civilization expert. Uh, Anthony, fascinating history that weaves into this topic. He's bringing some personal experience, but he also happens to be a professor of theology. So he's widely published authority in Christianity and brings his own expertise to this conversation. Um, you're joining us tonight uh, because of the Federation, particularly the Jewish Federation of Omaha. And we are here in partnership with the Philip M. and Ethel Klutznik Chair in Jewish Civilization at Creighton University. So it is, it is my great pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Greenspoon to start us off and um, get us moving forward. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this week as it always is. Uh, I know that in at least a few cases, um, people were not able to attend last week because of uh, power failures. Uh, I, I missed the 40 degree below weather there and I missed the 110 degree above zero weather there. And I am in uh, mild and um, melodious Milford, Connecticut. Um, Anthony is in Dayton and we're all together. I just wanted to say very briefly, uh, if you weren't here last week, rather than try to summarize the substance of what we did, what I realized actually this afternoon in thinking about this is that we have two parallel discussions going on. They're, 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 not, they're perfectly compatible and I would say actually uh, feed off in a very good way both of them, both of them. And they have to do with uh, the topic uh, with the three Ds, dinosaurs, demons, and uh, dragons. Yes, dragons have been demons. But also with the fact that um, my specialty is biblical studies, uh, Jewish interpretations and translations of the Bible. And one of the, one of the things we're looking at is different ways in which the Hebrew Bible slash Old Testament has been understood. Uh, and Anthony's specialty is, roughly speaking, um, looking at, um, we'd call it social, so no, what will we call your topic, uh, your general specialty? Uh, yeah, social memory theory. Yes, and it, it's, not the, it's not the same, obviously, but they're compatible. And that's, that's what I've just sort of seen as we worked on it. So we're looking at, the biblical text, we're looking at ways in which people remember the biblical text. And um, I will simply point out again that um, according to uh, the surveys that I've seen and seem to be as um, authoritative as possible, roughly 40%, that is four out of every 10 Americans uh, believes that uh, the universe was created between six and 10,000 years ago uh, on six consecutive 24 hour days. Okay, this is a literal reading of the biblical text. Um, it obviously has religious foundations. 40% uh, of Americans believe it. Anything 40% of Americans believe or don't believe is certainly worthy of our attention. Um, so well, the first thing I wanted to do this evening, uh, uh, Jenny was kind enough to, I think, send out to everybody some of the biblical text I want us to look at. Um, and the two different categories. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Actually, 
uh, you know, an agenda that's sort of a hidden agenda. We have no hidden agendas, but we have an informal agenda. And according to the informal agenda, uh, Anthony, you are going to first talk something about uh, the ways in which um, the flood, and in, in according to some views, has what me messed up the paleontological record. Wait. Yeah, right. I think that just as an addendum to last week, I think one thing that we probably should have made more clear is that the reason why a lot of Christians who hold a literal view of the Genesis narratives are interested in the flood, or in fact, maybe the main reason that they're interested in the flood is because if you do believe in a global flood, and, and very few scientists would go in for this theory, but if you do believe in a global flood, then that's going to redistribute and mess up all of the, all of these bones we're digging up. They're just not gonna date the way that we would imagine them to date. And so a lot of times the, bl the flood gets blamed for the fact that, the, that these bones look so old and why we find them the way that we find them. Um, and I just thought maybe those dots should be connected. Maybe that was really obvious to everyone, but I thought I would sort of connect those dots. I, I appreciate that. I'm sure everyone else does as well. Uh, just mentioning uh, a view that we, I think just went very quickly over last week and I, I don't know that we want to spend much more time on it, uh, but there are those who feel that the, uh, the reason why scientists date uh, fossils to two and a half or three billion years ago is that uh, God made these look like they were that old. And so that those of true faith, in this case, Christian faith, would recognize that they, they're not that old because they wouldn't contradict the biblical text which has six to 10,000 years ago. Uh, I'm not alone in finding that view to be incompatible with my understanding of God, it's sort of God the trickster. And uh, if, if I had to choose a view, uh, which fortunately I don't have to, uh, with a literal reading of the text, I would probably go for uh, the, the, the confusion caused by the flood. And because the flood was recorded again, looking at it literally as a unique event. Uh, and also, if you remember at the end of the flood account in Genesis, God promises never to destroy the world again by flood. So it's a unique event that will never occur again. And uh, therefore um, it could have uniquely, according to this view, uh, move things around in, in such a way that again, a uh, a godless or an atheist or, or a non-believing a non scientist uh, would ply his or her trade, but it would be inapplicable in this case. All right, thank you. And, and don't worry, Anthony will be back in a minute. Uh, um, I did want to look at a couple of biblical passages and they're in two groups and we'll look at them separately uh, because, uh, a question, it, it, again, it's not a question which is, uh, it's not a question that ever came to my mind until I started looking at it, but it's certainly on some people's minds. Uh, are there dinosaurs in the Bible? Okay, so uh, a quick perusal of sources indicates that the word dinosaur uh, is of 19th century origin. So I mean, so, uh, so it is, I'm sure there's a modern Hebrew word for dinosaur, but that, that's not going to be found in the biblical text. Are there dinosaur-like creatures in the Bible? Well, you can, you can say yes. Uh, people do say yes. And so I wanted just to briefly go over the passages. Jenny, you have them ready to roll. Uh, Indeed, I, yes. Just one second. So you intro it and I will share screen. Yes. And um, what I want to point out is that our major biblical sources for, uh, okay. Are you seeing it? Do I need to zoom in? Sometimes a little, that's a little bit bigger. 
I, maybe I don't, you don't need it. We can do all, we can do all, we can do all of behemoth at one time. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, both of the, the, the one passage which deals with behemoth and the main passage which deals with the Leviathan are found in chapters 40 and 41 of the book of Job. Uh, the context is not irrelevant. The context in the Bible, in, for the Bible is never irrelevant. In this case, um, as you recall, um, Job's, the severity of Job's punishment comes as a, a result of uh, a challenge made by the adversary, Hasatan, to God that yes, Job is perfect in his um, obedience to you. It's perfect in every respect. Well, why not? He has everything. Take everything away from him. He'll curse you. Uh, and then Job feels this punishment. And most of the book of Job it, uh, is Job's interaction with his quote unquote friends. And they're saying, Job, if you're being punished this way, you deserve it. And Job saying, no, I don't. And then finally in chapter 40, Job challenges God uh, issue of what we usually call theodicy or divine justice. And uh, God's response is in large part, who are you? Were you there at creation? And then uh, the account of Behemoth and the account of Leviathan are within that context. Uh, it, it's certainly no reason why Behemoth and Leviathan couldn't be drawn from actual uh, animals. Uh, it's again, it's, it's not required, of course, it depends on how you read the text. Uh, it's, we tend to say, uh, we tend to write behemoth with a capital B as if it's a proper name. And if you look here, this is the JPS translation. I think it's the 1917 one, but whatever it is, you notice that take now behemoth and it's not capitalized. And then you look down Leviathan is. Remember that um, Hebrew has, you can either say they have no capital letters or they have small letters. The determination whether it's a proper name is an editorial, uh, sometimes traditional view. Anyway, um, looking at Behemoth, we can read at least part of this. Take now Behemoth, whom I, that is God made, as I made you. He eats grass, his strength is in his loins, his might in the muscles of his belly, he makes his tail stand up like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are like tubes of bronze. His limbs are like iron rods. He is the first of God's works. Only God, that is his creator, can cast uh, the sword against him. And it goes on and on and on. Okay. Um, and then finally, a rhetorical question at the end of this section. Can he, can he be taken by his eyes? Can his nose be pierced by hooks? Only by God. Uh, is this the description of a dinosaur? Well, I looked up a few sources, that is to say conservative Christian sites uh, uh, that dealt with this and they said, well, you know what? Uh, this is not a description of an animal that's around now, but uh, it certainly looks like it could be a description of some dinosaurs based on the fossils we have. Uh, I mean, um, the, uh, the most staunch evangelical Christian doesn't deny that we have fossils that are dinosaurs, or what do you call dinosaurs? Is this a dinosaur? Perhaps. Um, just one more note here. Uh, behemoth, if you look at it uh, and you have some knowledge of Hebrew, it looks as if it's the feminine plural of a noun. That's an oath, it's the way in which feminine plurals are made in, uh, in, in Hebrew. And in fact, that's what it is. But it's not a plural, it's not creatures, it's a creature. And in trying to explain how a plural could be used to intensify the, the, the singular being, in this case, this is not just a animal, it's the greatest animal, a land animal that's ever created in, in, in my mind, you, it's comparable to the way in which we use the word Elohim to describe God. As God is, that's the word for God. It's a plural word. In, in biblical Hebrew, it takes a singular verb when it's the God of Israel. 
it takes a plural verb. It's if it's if it's uh, deities of the Canaanites, for example. But it's a sort of an intensive plural, and that seems to be what behemoth is. So um, this is a land-based creature. Uh, then, if we can go down, Jenny, um, I'm going to. Uh, we, have, we have to go, okay, we're out, actually it's going to be a, a little confusing and I, I'm just going to read the beginning of this and then we're going to move down a bit. That, but we're going to start with, can you draw out, Le no, I'm sorry, can you draw out Leviathan by a fish hook? Can you press down his tongue by a rope? Can you put a ring through his nose or pierce his jaw with a barb? Okay, so obviously the Leviathan is understood to be a, uh, a monster of the sea. Um, the etymology of the word Leviathan, as far as I can tell, is uncertain. Uh, I've seen it associated with a Hebrew noun, which means Hebrew adjective, which means uh, twisted. Uh, uh, my uh, son-in-law, who's the father of the grand twins, who are visiting now, along with my daughter, his wife, um, who has a traditional yeshiva background, said that he had been taught that the word Leviathan comes from the same word as Levite, the same root as that, uh, which means to accompany. And in fact, uh, one of the traditions uh, is that God and only God, after the six days of creation, what did he do for fun? He played with the Leviathan who accompanied him. All right, so if you can go down, Jenny, to the beginning of chapter 41, which is just on the next screen, I hope, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, uh, about him. One is prostrated by, the very, prostrated by the very sight of him. There was no one so fierce as to rouse him. Um, and then it talks about uh, his outer garment, his, the folds of his jowls, the open doors of his faith, face, his bare teeth strike a terror, his protective scales or his pride locked with a binding seal. One scale touches the other. I can't help but get dramatic about it because it's dramatic. Not even a breach can enter between them. Each clings to itself. They are in a lock, so they cannot be parted. His sneezing flash lightning, and his eyes are like the glimmers of dawn. Firebrands stream from his, uh, from his mouth. Fiery sparks escape. Out of his nostrils come smoke. This is a fearsome creature. No question about it. And it's a sea creature. Um, if you continue down, just to two other... Now, Chris, could this be a, a, a dinosaur that was more aquatic than terrestrial dinosaurs, perhaps. Okay, um, go down a little bit further um, because I want to look at two other places. I'm sorry, I keep going, I keep going. This is not fair to you, but okay. So in Psalm 104, uh, there's a reference to that. Uh, there is the sea vast and wide with its creatures beyond number, living things small and great. They go to the ships and Leviathan that you form to sport him. So this is the origin of that uh, rabbinic midrash that after God created the world and he rested for the Sabbath, what did he do for fun? He played with the Leviathan. Not that the Leviathan is, is something that you or I would be able to play with. And then finally, in the first verse of chapter 27 of Isaiah, in that day, the Lord will punish with his great, cruel, mighty sword, Leviathan, the elusive serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, he will slay the dragon of the sea. Now, given my understanding of, of, of biblical poetry, I would uh, certainly, uh, the elusive serpent, the twisting serpent, they're, they're clearly references to the same thing. I would assume that the dragon of the sea is, is just another reference also to Leviathan. So what, what I, when I was thinking, okay, what can we say about this in, in reference to a Jewish tradition. Um, well, and we're not talking now about Genesis 1, which if we have time, we'll come back to. But what was very interesting to me, uh, a couple of years ago, and those of you with uh, really strong memories, which is all of you, remember we did a symposium a couple of years ago called Olom Hazet, the Olom Haba, this world and the world to come in Jewish belief and practice. And one of the presentations was on the fact, oh, it's, a, it's, it's a belief, the fact that there is this belief, I wouldn't say it's a fact, that after observant Jews die and they go to the world to come, they eat 
and this is a term used by the author of the article, I think this is an analogy he used, uh, a smorgasbord that would make Las Vegas um, look like nothing in comparison. And what did observant Jews who made it to heaven eat? All the Hazarai that you can imagine. And included in that Hazarai, they would eat from Behemoth, and they would eat from Leviathan, and then in, that's a lesser known uh, third party, that is to say an, a, a flying creature named Ziz, uh, and, and, and all of the most observant Jews would eat from the most succulent parts uh, of these animals. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it sounds as if this is perhaps a peripheral view, a peripheral view. What's, it's, it's pretty well known among, I, look, I didn't know it until the presentation was made at a symposium several years ago, but, but it is part of what a, uh, a, a young man, maybe a young woman would, would learn in the yeshiva education. And basically, um, observant Jews ob uh, keep strictly the laws of kashrut, uh, including you're not going to be eating shellfish, you're not going to be eating pork, and you're not going to be eating leviathan. Uh, as a reward for not doing that in life, when you go to uh, Alom Haba, the world to come, however we conceive of it, you eat that all the time, day and night, morning, noon, afternoon, all the time. Uh, it's like a reward for delayed gratification. Uh, it's, I, I would say, we might say it's neither here nor there, but if uh, it, in terms of um, traditional Judaism, as I explored it, at least some, uh, the, the action, as it were, related to uh, Leviathan and uh, uh, Behemoth uh, come after life. And the only other point I could mention was that there's a general agreement among um, rabbinic authorities that dealt with this, that steps needed to be taken to ensure that the male behemoth and the female behemoth did not mate because their offspring would overtake the world. So there's castration and there's all kinds of ways in which that, that's dealt with. All right. Um, I'm, I've introduced this material. Um, I, I, I think it's all fascinating. Um, and um, the, the next item, as it were, on our not hidden agenda, because we have no hidden agenda here, uh, Anthony is going to talk about uh, particular Protestant beliefs. And as, as I've said before, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, uh, beliefs which are deeply held by large numbers of Protestants become, if not the majority, certainly a very strong plurality view. Is that, is that a good lead in, Anthony? That's I did perfect. That okay? That's great. I, in a moment, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, now, I want to make sure that you can hear me while I'm doing this. So if, uh, you know, wave me down or something, if, if for some reason I mess up the, uh, the Zoom presentation. Okay, I, um, I'm a good Presbyterian, all right? So that's, I, I didn't grow up Presbyterian. I married into it. I, I grew up in a very fundamentalist church. But as an adult, my wife was Presbyterian and I started going to her church. And eventually I, I became a Presbyterian member of PCUSA. Now, I think that you might find that some of the more progressive, for good and ill, uh, progressive Christians in America will probably come from the PCUSA, uh, but it was not always this way. In fact, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the American Christian aversion to mainstream science by way of Scotland, by way, through, through the uh, Presbyterian counterparts, which I think are maybe the the chief um, the chief offenders uh, in this. So we're going to have to do a little bit of a, do about five hundred years of history in about five minutes. But before I do that, uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. 
and I want to make sure that everyone can see what I'm sharing. Does everyone see what looks to be like a medieval document? Yes. All right, excellent. So I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. This is the um, this is from the A University of Aberdeen website, and this is called the Aberdeen Bestiary. If you're not familiar with a, what a bestiary is, basically, this is the closest thing that we came to a science textbook for the Christians in the year 1200. Okay, and what you would find in these bestiaries is these beautifully drawn. Um, photographs. This is a photo. Or a photograph. It's this actually is a, a, a illustration. This is an illumination. It's not a photograph, as you might have told. Uh, all right. So what this here is, this is an illumination of a dragon. It looks very snake-like. A dragon that is attacking an elephant. All right. What a bestiary was is it would go through different bits of animal uh, knowledge bits of foliage, knowledge, and then it would theologize these things, All right? So I'm gonna, basically this, this passage here, here's the, the, the uh, a translation here, but I'm gonna begin with the entry, this is like an encyclopedia entry in, the, in, the, in 1200 on the dragon. So right after we talk about snakes and right after we talk about a tree that grows in India, we hear about this, dra this dragon as if it's a real creature in the world. And that's, that's what a lot of people thought. So of the dragon, that's the, that's the entry title. The dragon is bigger than all of the other snakes or all the other living things on earth. For this reason, I'm gonna go to the next folio here, jumping ahead. And I'm going to make sure I show my translation here. This is this this image down here. I'll talk about in a bit, but it doesn't relate to the dragon. You saw the image of the dragon already. It's it's uh, derived from the Latin name Draco. The dragon, it is said, is often drawn forth from caves into the open air, causing the air to become turbulent. Interestingly enough, this coincides with um, Chinese dragon mythology, that the the dragons would actually uh, stir up the, the, the air, the clouds, and make it rain. So interesting that we have this text from Europe that has the same mythology. The dragon has a crest, a small mouth, and narrow blowholes through which it breathes and puts forth its tongue. Its strength lies not in its teeth, but in its tail, and kills with a blow rather than a bite. All right, now, hold on here, because you're about to see what makes a bestiary specifically Catholic, all right? Not only would they tell you about these animals that exist in the world, but they would then draw a, an analogy and teach you something theologically uh, from, from nature, all right? Um, <clears throat> it kills with a blow rather than a bite. It is free from poison. It is said that it does not need poison to kill things because it kills anything around which it wraps its tail. From the dragon, not even the elephant with its huge size is safe. For lurking on the paths along which the elephant are accustomed to pass, the dragon knots its tail around their legs and kills them by suffocation. Right? This is, this is their, their best idea of what a scientific view on dragons would be. Dragons are born in Ethiopia and in India where it is hot all year round. The devil is like the dragon. He is the most monstrous serpent of all. He is often aroused from his cave and causes the air to shine because emerging from the depths, he transforms himself into the angel of light and deceives the foolish with the hope of vainglory and worldly pleasure. Okay, so this is going to start to warn good Catholic people not to be tempted by Satan and learn, take this lesson from the dragon. And you could get the same thing. We, we, if we read a little bit further, we'd hear about wolves. We'd hear about, um, this, this is the, uh, this image here, I'll zoom in here. All right, this is a weasel attacking a basilisk. Um, now, you know, weasels are real, right? <laughs> So anyway, it'll tell you all about uh, it'll tell you about about weasels and snakes and and newts, but it'll also include things like 
a, a monoceros, which is like a, a what do you call these things? A unicorn. <laughs> It includes things like a unicorn or a dragon. And the idea here was that, look, even though we haven't seen a dragon in our village, there's all kinds of stories about dragons. In fact, I know I've got a cousin. He saw a dragon once. You know, so you have to include these things in this scientific textbook. But the, the reason why I'm drawing this out is because in these in this scientific view of the world, there was often an attempt to allegorize the things that we see around us because it'll tell us something about human nature or the nature of God. And we see that happening here with the dragon. Okay, so that was that is kind of what the, <clears throat> sorry, that is kind of what the standard interpretation, Catholic interpretation of scripture and nature would do. It's interesting in so much it can be allegorized. It's interesting in so much it can be allegorized and it can tell me something about God or the devil or humankind, all right? Now this changes and I'm gonna go ahead and unshare my screen. I, I'm gonna try anyway. I'm going to pause my share or stop share. All right, did that work? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, no more visuals, it's just me now. Sorry to disappoint. Um, okay, so when we get, we're gonna fast forward a bit to Martin Luther, all right? So as a Protestant, we, we know that Luther protested against the traditions and the authority of the Catholic Church. And that's a long story, we don't have to go into it, but it caused a major church split. And the followers of Luther rejected not just the Catholic Church, but Catholic tradition. And Catholic tradition had these kinds of sort of folk tales going along with them. All right. So in, in other words, in addition to um, uh, rejecting teach, Catholic teaching on the Bible, the Protestants also rejected Catholic teaching about the natural world, which they they thought saw as as faulty. All right. So as we sort of move into, I, I promised that we talk a little bit about Scotland here. That's fine. Uh, we're, uh, so we're going to move back to Scotland uh, in the um, in the 1700s. Okay. And I'll just go ahead and read this part because I think I wrote it better than I can summarize here. In order to displace the authority of the Catholic tradition, Luther and his followers leaned into the authority of scripture in a new way. This move attempted to erase the esoteric and allegorical teachings of priests, which looked to require special training, right? That, that the Aberdeen bestiary was written by someone who had amazing elite education just because it's written as it is. Uh, commoners couldn't write, for instance. Rather, the Protestants believed that anyone with a Bible could read for themselves and understand simple, the simple, plain meaning of the text. So there was a democratizing element of scripture that happened with the, the Protestants. There was no hidden or deeper allegory. And, be, and, and they thought uh, this about <laughs> both scripture and nature. Right? There's nothing deeper than what I see. There was no hidden or deeper allegory because the true meaning was the literal meaning, and that is what we need to emphasize here. The true meaning for the Protestants was the literal meaning. So while previous interpreters had read something like Genesis 1 as an allegory, these Protestants started to read passages like Genesis 1, passages like the one we saw about Leviathan and Behemoth, as simple, literal descriptions of the natural world, okay? Because the true meaning was the literal meaning, emphasis on literal here. These texts were read as literal accounts of what happened from Genesis to Solomon, from Solomon to Jesus, from Jesus to the book of Revelation, literal. All right, that's the key. The second reason for the Protestant resistance to science came with a rejection of Aristotle, interestingly enough. Really, the world of Christendom before Luther was the world that Aristotle created. So the best and brightest within the Catholic intelligentsia were 
they were really Aristotelian with a sort of Christian veneer. Now, Aristotle's worldview was pre-modern, but it promoted scientific inquiry. So because the Catholics were children of Aristotle, the Protestants viewed this tradition as suspect, and they rejected it in favor of approaches to the natural world that any commoner could understand. And about the same time the Protestant Refor Reformation is happening, Francis Bacon was arguing that common human experience was the best way to begin to understand the way the world worked, all right? That, that's sort of this crucial element that goes into what, what we're calling Scottish common sense realism. All right. In the United States, the counterparts to Scottish common sense realism were these, um, these early Presbyterians in the, in the United States. And they were very, very influenced by Thomas Reed, who was sort of a chief proponent of Scottish common sense realism. And with that came this idea that the Bible, if true, needed to be read literally. And that's how it came. That's how that particular very idiosyncratic American Christian Protestant view came to the United States. It actually came through some of these chief theologians in, in Princeton. So before Princeton uh, became, Princeton Theological Seminary uh, became so named, it was just called Princeton Seminary. And some of the chief theologians for the Presbyterians were coming out of that school and teaching their students, teaching pastors, that they should read the Bible literally. Um, so that's, for instance, uh, here's a, a line from the Westminster Confession of Faith. This is, comes out of Scotland. Um, it's just a couple lines here, but this is what, uh, what my church uh, begins with. And then there's revisions and revisions and re revisions on, on this creed. This is one of the creeds. The Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek being immediately inspired by God and by this singular care and providence kept pure in all ages and therefore authentical. So deep in the roots of this Scottish common sense realism is this Presbyterian notion that the Bible must be read literally. And that's why Christians, some a lot of Christians in, in America, not all, but a lot of them in, in America, read texts like the Leviathan text and the Behemoth text and the Genesis 1 text literally. That, that's a very short overview of a very long and complicated topic, but I think that we're ready, Leonard, if you want to, to jump into that um, Genesis 1 text. Thank you. That was amazing and very clear. Um, and I just wanted to add that there was a parallel development in Judaism, parallel but by no means identical. Uh, a bit earlier than the time of, of Luther, um, and that's Rashi. Up mm -hmm. until the time of Rashi, uh, the biblical text was essentially understood allegorically. Mm -hmm. Now, what Rashi called for is what we call pshat, not the literal reading of the text, but the plain reading of the text. Uh, the literal and the plain reading are not the same. I mean, look, um, I've spent a lot of time in my life dealing with people who say, read the Bible literally, or you're not reading it seriously. And I've had, it's not something that can be found in Judaism. Neither Jews nor Roman Catholics are by tradition literalists. Uh, but within Judaism, there was also this move away from um, allegorical reading, not entirely, of course, because of course we still have it. There's one other thing very quickly just to draw together what Anthony was talking about in the beginning, uh, in, in a very different way, uh, the, the rabbis uh, for, had their own, again, take on a lot of this mentioned unicorns. According to the rabbis, the, uh, the tabernacle was made from unicorn skin. And uh, again, my, my uh, son-in-law, my oldest, older son-in-law tonight was reading from a Talmudic passage where there's a major discussion of mermaids. The assumption is mermaids exist. 
And then the question, there were two questions. One, um, are mermaids kosher? And the other one was uh, somebody, at one rabbi had heard, I think they were pulling our leg anyway, but one, one, one rabbi had read somewhere or heard somewhere that mermaids and humans can mate, which would be another reason why mermaids would, wouldn't, be, um, wouldn't be kosher. Uh, it, it was just, <laughs> it just accepted. Um, do you think we should back and go ahead or we can stop the questions? Um, I, uh, Jenny, do you think that from, uh, have you seen some questions in the comments section that we should be looking at? Uh, do, you want, do you want me to go ahead? I have not seen any comments come in. Um, I just see a lot of, I just see the number nine uh, on, uh, 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 well, we, we haven't had questions. We've had comments. So um, Michael was saying that he's read that some have interpreted the behemoth as hippopotamus and Leviathan as crocodile. Absolutely. Um, and he also really likes the way that Dr. Ladon so clearly explains the connection between the Reformation and the literal view of the scripture. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, yeah. And yes, it, that, I have heard it discussed at far greater length and with far less clarity than than Anthony did. Uh, let me go. Let me move ahead. It shouldn't take very long. Of course, we always think it won't take very long. I just want us to go back for the moment. Jenny, could you pull up Genesis one, please? I mean, oh yes. yeah, we all know Genesis one. Uh, but I just want to look at it. It's worth looking at for a moment. Uh, I. I was uh, not afraid, but I was concerned that, I, that I, I meant to pull the old JPS translation, translation from 1917, the translation I was bar mitzvahed with and married with and all of that. Um, this is the new JPS, and I don't want us right now to be concerned with why the new JPS translation be, begins when God began to create instead of in the beginning God created. Uh, it, it, it just happens that the first word of the Hebrew Bible, Boreshit, it, it is impossible to be certain exactly what it means. Although it's certainly, it, it, it's got something to do with beginning, but whether it's in the beginning or, and, and this is uh, a view which supports a traditional Christian view of, of creatio ex nihilo, world's created out of nothing in the beginning, or whether there was already a process going on, which when God began to create, which is by the way, the way Rashi understood the text. Uh, but we won't look at that. We'll, we'll just look at a couple of the, the passages very quickly. Um, do, 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 do. Let's go down to, um, oh wait, so, so okay, we thought in the beginning, um, God said, let there be light and there was light. God said the light was, God saw the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called, uh, called the day, the light day and the darkness he called night and that was evening and that was morning, a first day. Other uh, translations less exactly have day one, but it's an ordinal number. Um, I don't, Steve, Steve Wykes and I were talking a little bit earlier today and it's quite amazing that the light and the the darkness or this the opposite of light are created several days before the luminaries. This is this is um, uh, as, as this is a special, if you will, celestial produced light and darkness. Uh, could you go down, Jenny, to the next? Let's try the next screen. Um, all right. So in. Um, We'll go down to the fifth day. God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and birds that fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. God created the great sea monsters. All right, what is that? Ah, it sounds a lot like Leviathan. Maybe it's dinosaurs. Um, who knows? That was day five or the fifth day. On the sixth day, uh, which ends with the creation of humans, but it begins with God bringing forth every kind of living creature. God made wild beasts 
oh, there's behemoth right there if I've ever seen them. Uh, and then humans are created. All right, so we read this text um, and um, what Anthony pointed out so beautifully was we, we might assume or we might have assumed that the literal reading of the text is what everybody did until there was some reason not to for maybe the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, but that of course it really is not the case. But if we were to read this text literally um, and um, we've got day six and day, and, uh, day six uh, wild beasts of which one would certainly be a dinosaur was created on that same day earth was created. And uh, so I looked at some sort of what I would call pseudo scientific, because not really scientific, but sort of pseudo scientific evangelical uh, commentary, as it were. And so um, one of the commentators said, okay, um, the word day, which is used here for each day, it is the everyday, if you will, Hebrew word used in antiquity and the modern world, yom. That's absolutely true. Why don't we take this to be a 24 hour period? We understand day. All right, so the, the pseudoscience of this pseudo, what I call um, uh, educated, uh, sophisticated view says there are I don't know, 3,546 usages of yom in, in various forms in the Hebrew Bible. Now, these days with uh, electronic versions of the Bible, we can check that easily. But then the person who I was reading goes on to assert, in every case outside of Genesis 1, yom refers to 24-hour period. Why shouldn't it here? That's not scientific. Trust me. There are plenty of places where Yom does not refer to a 24 hour period. It's a generalized term. Uh, so you, you can sort of pick and choose. Um, and what I wanna just simply point out, um, just one other thing that I, 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 I wanna point out is that the only way in my view, and it's not my idiosyncratic view, it's wildly held, the only way that we can really read any literature is by knowing the genre. And so um, I remember once uh, talking to a conservative student of mine. We don't have very many conservative Protestant students at Creighton, mostly a Catholic, but there are, there are some. And he reads the Bible literally. So I said, when, when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, he said, well, you, of course, you can't take that literally. That's a parable. Uh, I said, what about Lot's wife being turned into salt? We said, of course, you can take that literally. Why not? Uh, so th th there's a lot, th th there's a lot here, um, but we have to, I was saying to get to the point as succinctly as I can, I was like, what do we imagine or how do we know or what, what is the genre of Genesis 1? Uh, now, um, as I point out my own sort of uh, unsophisticated way, we have verbal clues. Once upon a time, what's, that, what's going to follow that fairy tale? Uh, undoubtedly, they had, but there are ways in which ancient writers would indicate the genre. Many of them, as far as I can tell, we really haven't teased out yet. One of the most, um, for me, one of the most um, rewarding experiences has been to find that a lot of my colleagues over the last 40 years have found humor all over the place, including ancient Assyrian text, which look very serious. But now, oh yeah, we, they tease out humor, but the ways in which we show humor uh, are including oral presentation, we don't have access to. So without, I mean, it's easy enough to say, oh yeah, Genesis one is not science, uh, at, at, as if there were science, whenever Genesis one were written, but then sort of the, what do we think it is? And uh, the only point about which I will be, and then I'll be quite a bit, sort of adamant about is that reading the text literally 
as is part of the tradition that Anthony describes so well, is an alternative. It's not one which I think is especially uh, worthwhile or meaningful. But it's certainly, oh, but it's not as so many people have said to me over the years. Oh, if you're not reading it literally. You're not reading it seriously. And I don't think I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, so these are th this is a, fa a foundational text, and um, uh, so I just wanted again. It's the kind of text that we all know but it's just worth looking at a little bit. Um, okay, so I will now not say another word. And um, Anthony, if you wanna, you wanna speak some and you wanna- well, I think we should ahead. open to, to questions if, yes. if we have, uh, if anyone has questions or just uh, would like to maybe ask for clarification or- Well, Don't all I, talk over each other. <laughs> could I ask? Could I ask Leonard um, what um, you could bring to this discussion in terms of all the work you've done about translations? I mean, you know, the the various translations of the uh, of the scriptures. How does that fit in, or might it fit in at all to this conversation? I have not investigated this particular. Uh, this particular issue, wh whether there's a translation which uses which uses dinosaur doesn't doesn't use it. Um, I will just simply say, it's not an aside, um, but it's worth observing uh, that uh, the the passages in Job that we looked at, and the passage in Psalm we looked at, and the passage we looked in Isaiah, these are poetry, and it, in my experience, the more quote unquote traditional translations in the vein of King James, or it doesn't have to be King James, but in the vein of King James, or for today's Jewish audience, the translation that Robert Alter uh, produced are far more evocative uh, in my mind of the, the character of the original text than a, a more free translation. Uh, I thought the JPS translation there was fine, um, but I, and I'll look into that between now and next week, Michael, just to see if I can find out, because uh, I, I did not have enough time. Uh, and we have you know, translations like the Living Bible and some others that are paraphrased. And I, I think the chances that in one of those, someone might have just gone ahead and placed the dinosaur explicitly in the text is probably, <laughs> is probably good. Leonard, I've got a question Thank for you. you. If you don't mind, Leonard, I've got a question about that relates to, I think, a, a key uh, Jewish and Christian difference in that um, there's there's a lot there's not a lot of impetus among the Christians to teach their children Hebrew, um, and my my I mean the, the, what I learned in seminary about this, and you can correct me if I'm wrong is that we see a, quite a bit of Hebrew parallelism in, in Genesis 1, um, suggestion of, uh, su suggesting poetic verse. W would that be a, a safe assumption? Yes. See, I, I think absolutely. that this is kind of a crucial point because I think a lot of Christians wouldn't know that. I, I, I didn't know that. Like I, I, I studied the Bible quite a bit before I, before I was an adult. And, and he, I never heard that the, the Genesis one was written in poetic parallelism. To me, that would, that might have changed that sort of genre distinction might have helped me see that, pa that passage differently. Um, because it just looked like all the other block texts I've seen everywhere else in the Bible, right? So, so in other words, I think it might have been helpful for me early on to see it written in in parallel verse uh, maybe that would have clued me in <laughs> to the kind of genre i'm encountering here yes i mean um although uh i have a a caveat that is to say a a, a yes but in the sense that um presumably you uh I, without reading too much into what you're saying you're thinking that uh, Poetry is less likely to be 
what's less likely to be understood as a, a factual account or something or a historical account. Uh, yeah, I think no, I think that's probably the assumption. I was thinking more. I, I'm more likely to find uh, historical tidbits in the in the quote unquote historical sections. You know what I mean? Uh, but you're you're right. That that's probably a, a, a simplistic way to look at it. No, and and, and alas, um, I mean you can test this hypothesis yourself by looking at uh, Exodus 14 and Exodus 15. Exodus 14 is a prose account of the crossing mm. of the sea. And Exodus 15 is a poetic account, and by common assent among, well, I can't say critical scholars agree on anything, <laughs> except that the text wasn't written by Moses, maybe. But um, beyond that, uh, Exodus 15 is generally considered to be one of the oldest portions of the Bible. Right. In the same way that in the early chapters of Judges, there's a prose account of uh, Deborah and the defeat of the Canaanites, and then there's a poetic account. Mm. Uh, but but I think there's, uh, I mean, one of the reasons why the why Genesis 1 through chapter 2, verse 4 and a half, um, is considered to be an account of creation from the priestly tradition is, is that it has a, a repetitive nature and a formal nature, which we ascribe to um, priestly pronouncements um hmm. i i don't know I, I, it's it's um it's off the subject but only slightly just very quickly though uh, one of the things i discovered uh, when i you know began to in the field and i would look this was again we're talking now about the early late 60s and early 70s was uh typically i would think of a german scholar in heidelberg or uh, uh, one of one of the big Germans, uh, one of the big German university cities in the 19th century, say, "Oh, wait a minute! Here in Genesis one, it says God, and Genesis two four, in the, in the middle of the second of the fourth verse, it says Lord God. Whoa, this is a big difference, and, and it may be a big difference, but what at that time wasn't really brought into the um, the, the scholarly conversation was the rabbis, had, the rabbis who knew the text." much more deeply, I think, and intimately than anyone today would, they also recognized that. They had their own ways of dealing with it. Mm. Uh, and uh, for the rabbis, Genesis 1, uh, traditionally rabbis, the, 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 uh, Genesis 1 showed God's um, transcendence. God created the world. He spoke. The, in Genesis 2, uh, 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 an incredible anthropomorphic uh, picture of God coming down on earth. And Adam and Eve can hear God's footprints and they hide. Uh, and this is reflected the eminence of God. You pray to God um, because he's powerful, but you can pray to God because he's at the same time close to us. So the rabbis, uh, the rabbis are certainly less concerned. And Judy, Jews today are certainly, isn't that there's no Jews, Jews today who are not uh, young earth creationists? That there are, and we've got, of course, the Jewish calendar, which uh, is one way of going back to quote unquote the beginning. Uh, but it 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 it's really it's it's not a, if you will, my understanding, it's not an article of faith, as it were. Mm, um, mm -hmm. do, that makes I, sense. I see the uh, Jenny. You're the timekeeper. I'm just looking to see. It is. It is the. It, it is that time. Uh, I want to say just very briefly. Uh, next week, um, we are going to turn, at least according to our not hidden agenda, but Anthony and I will plot some, uh, to the last couple of hundred years and the ways in which, um, the ways in which that presented challenges, no question of challenges to traditional religion and the ways in which that was dealt with, um, and we can also then, I see that was just a question, probably we won't have time too much uh, to look at right now, but um, uh, how do we, you know, it's, it's, it's not just an esoteric, certainly not, it's not a, meant to be an esoteric conversation about abstractions, but you know, how do we relate to um, the biblical, the, the the biblical passages and the um, scientific 
um, achievements. And so we certainly talk about that some uh, as well next time. And if I have a chance, um, I can, I have already drawn some, uh, a few traditional Jewish sources, but you know, what, for example, uh, uh, did, did the Chabad, the Chabad Rebbe, uh, what are his pronouncements? Or, or some, some of the things I could be looking for, if that's okay. Yes. Sounds fantastic. Uh, Arie, you are muted. Hmm? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. I, one thing that uh, I always remember from my uh, seminary classes was the definition about reading a Bible in translation. And the professor said, reading a Bible translation is like kissing a bride through a veil. And I thought it would be nice to add this to the conversation. That's fantastic. Thank you. I would, I would make one other comment um, that, that I'm glad to hear uh, you guys talk about humor because, um, you know, to however many years, 2,500, 2,800 years after the, um, the, uh, the, the Tanakh was, was written and, and 1500 years after, or 20 after the, you know, 50 more than that, 1800 years after the Talmud, um, we read it without any sense of humor at all. There, there, we, 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 uh, we don't see jokes. We don't understand or read wordplay in the text. We're, 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 we're reading it without um, the context of the people who wrote it. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you talk about that because uh, uh, certainly there are a lot of jokes in Talmud. There, there, there's no, when, when you turn to a page and you read a debate about uh, can an elephant be the wall of a sukkah, you know that guys were hanging around <laughs> making jokes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> ah, for those who are so interested, you can remember our symposium on Jews and humor and the volume we produced. Uh, which has become something of supportive for some people and for those who believe that Jewish humor did not exist before the beginning of the 18th century and is related to the rise of Yiddish, it's a foil, but yes, thank you. Wonderful. Well, it was a pleasure having everyone on tonight and we will we'll see you again next week. Tell, tell your friends. <laughs>